Good evening. My name is Tina Pang. I'm president of the Oriental Ceramic Society of Hong Kong. Welcome to the AGM lecture. I'm thrilled to be presenting uh, Catherine Maudsley, who is a former OCS Exco member and in Hong Kong barely needs any introduction. She moved to Hong Kong from Canada to pursue her studies in Chinese art history under the late Professor Shi Xiaoyan at Hong Kong U. Since then, she's distinguished herself as an art historian, art advisor, curator, I forgot about the clock, <laughs> educator and writer. She's an advisor and curator to distinguished private art collections, notably the MK Lau collection in Hong Kong, as well as others worldwide. Recently, she curated the critically acclaimed exhibitions, Irene Joad Rediscovered, paintings from the MK Lau collection in Hong Kong, and The Journey, Wesley Tongson at the Chinese Cultural, Cultural Foundation in San Francisco. Catherine is a regular lecturer for global forums and a wide range of educational institutions, including Christie's Education, the Department of Fine Arts at the U University of Hong Kong, now renamed the Department of Art History, the Hong Kong Art School, the Ink Society, Sotheby's Institute of Art and UBS Art Education Series. She's contributed to and edited numerous art related books and has published in specialist magazines such as Arts of Asia, Orientations, as well as others. She's also the recipient of over 20 awards for exceptional achievement. As many of us are becoming increasingly aware, the contributions of women to history and art history have often been neglected. So I'm delighted that the topic of Catherine's talk this evening features four visionary female collectors. Through the prism of her own experience working with collectors, Catherine will discuss how the building of a significant art collection takes vision, creativity and dedication. Helena Rubenstein, Peggy Guggenheim, Barbara Hutton and Doris Duke each built formidable collections, leaving enduring and significant legacies. Catherine will discuss the lasting contributions and impact that these women have made through their collections. So I'm delighted to welcome Catherine Maudsley. So good evening in Hong Kong. Welcome and uh, thank you so much, Tina, for your very, very kind remarks. As you mentioned, this evening we're going to look at four visionary women art collectors. It's a subject that has intrigued me, concerned me for quite a while because I do believe that women are very underrepresented as solo collectors. We do find many exceptional collections that are founded, developed, grown by couples um, where a woman is a very active part. But for this talk, I'd like us to concentrate on four uh, 20th century women collectors. So with the introductory slide, on the upper left, you see the Guggenheim, uh, Peggy Guggenheim collection. Many of you will recognize right away the Calder and the um, painting in the background, the Picasso. On the upper right is a stupendous jade necklace that belonged to Barbara Hutton. On the bottom right is an installation view of a recent exhibition in New York of the Helena Rubinstein uh, collection. And on the bottom left is um, the cover of a book from Doris Duke. So let us go on to the next slide, please. Here's um, linking a little bit better for the four women collectors. Um, we're not following them chronologically clockwise. Uh, we're following the order that they're presented. So let us start chronologically. The bottom right, Helena Rubinstein, born in 1870, passed away in 1965. And then to the left of her, you see some of the numerous portraits that she commissioned of herself. Helena Rubinstein, as you may recognize, the name was a great cosmetics genius, and she was very interested in the face. Now, next in line, in chronological line, is Peggy Guggenheim. Peggy Guggenheim 
1898 to 1979. And we see the beautiful Palazzo, which is now the uh, Guggenheim collection in Venice. Then we have two women who actually knew each other quite well, and both of them are presented as ingenues. They were debutantes. They were both born to exceptionally wealthy families. Barbara Hutton, her wealth came from the Five and Dime store, Woolworths. And Doris Duke on the bottom left, born in the same year as Barbara Hutton, um, her fortune came from her father, uh, who grew his wealth from tobacco, Duke, Duke University, and so on. The name is quite recognizable. This evening, I'd really love us to consider putting these four women in a timeline. And as Tina and Chris mentioned in the AGM, we're very much products of our time. Um, right now, in the 21st century, we're facing some global issues of interest and importance. So let's look at the 20th century. What happened during the time of these four visionary women collectors? Starting from the left, we have a reminder again of Helena Rubinstein to the right, Peggy Guggenheim, Barbara Hutton, and Doris Duke. And beneath, um, I've, I've looked uh, starting in the 19th century, um, starting 1880 to 1920. Now, some of the key issues that occurred are mentioned, are isolated, because they have a very definite impact on the whys, the wherefores, the causes, the conditions of these visionary women collectors. First off, from 1880 to 1900, we see colonial rule over the African interior. So colonialism, imperialism are very, very big issues in global history that have a definite impact on collecting and the availability of certain types of art. Next, and known very well to us of it in Hong Kong and in the Oriental Ceramic Society because of our fascination with Chinese art, is the fall of the Qing Dynasty. What did this mean? It meant that the imperial collections became available to the world outside the Forbidden City. Of course, then 1914 to 1918, we have the tumultuous World War I. Next up, we look at the period 1921 to 1945. 1935 stands out for all of us interested in Chinese art and culture, particularly ceramics, because of the London International Exhibition of Chinese Art. This was a tremendous event that brought to world attention, especially imperial art of uh, China. The Great Depression, 1929 to 1939, what does that mean? That means that art that had been in private hands of economic necessity now became very available to those who were lucky enough to have funds to purchase items from those who didn't. 1939 to 1945 is World War II. Very, very big impact on the life of Peggy Guggenheim and her move to America and some of the artists she introduced that she got out of Nazi-occupied Europe. 1946 to 1965. 1948 was actually the 24th Venice Biennale, already the 24th one. And it's mentioned here because this is where Peggy Guggenheim showed her collection uh, in the Greek pavilion. Greece was not able in that year, 1948, to display, so Peggy Guggenheim did. And it's very notable at that time that she's a very, very serious, serious woman about art. 1949, Pan Am, some of you may not know the name so well because it no longer exists. Pan American Airlines was the first um, airline to create round the world flights. How so and why is it important to us to recall this is because the four visionary women collectors were considering were not what I would call globetrotters, but they did travel. It meant their vista for collecting was global. So I'd like to introduce the thought here of globalization. 1953, Helena Rubinstein was so successful that she was able to establish her own foundation for um, 
betterment of society and specific aims to encourage women in education and many other aspects. 1966 to 1985, um, well, Man on the Moon, it's not mentioned here, but that expands our vista once again. In 1966, there was a massive set of auctions through, uh, over many, many days of the Helena Rubinstein collection. And that was by the forerunner or the previous partner to Park Brunet um, in New York and later Park Brunet Sotheby's. 1970, Peggy Guggenheim donated her palazzo, which we'll see pictures of later, uh, to the Solomon Guggenheim Foundation. Her family member, uh, and you know the Guggenheim in New York, the museum. In 73, she actually donated her collection to that foundation, thus laying the groundwork for how and why we are able today to see the Guggenheim collection in Venice. In 1996, in much more recent history, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation was set up, and that has a very, very definite um, terrific outcome for those of us who love art and want to look at the legacy of the four women collectors. Helena Rubinstein was a self-made woman born in Poland. She went from Poland to um, Krakow where she was born to Vienna, then she moved on to Australia, then she moved to United States. She then took up residence in Paris back and forth and was an absolutely formidable, not very tall, but very, very ambitious woman at a time where it was very rare for solo women entrepreneurs. Cosmetics was her game. And what she did was she was such a brilliant marketer that one aspect we'd like to look at with her collecting is how she merged commerce and culture commerce and culture. Today, that's what many um, high-end brands do when they present to us a unified holistic front. Helena Rubinstein was absolutely brilliant at that. Now we come to something that is perhaps a little bit controversial. I'll mention a little bit later that it's a subject of great exploration. And why do I say this? It's because of what we're very aware of in the 21st century about Black Lives Matter. Now, Man Ray was a very famous photographer, sort of took a very surrealistic approach to his photography. We see his 1926 photogra photograph of juxtaposing a live white woman with an African artifact. It's called Noir et Blanche black and white. Helena Rubinstein was a formidable collector of African art. In 1935, as part of her marketing of herself and her culture, her sensibility of aesthetics, she presented this image of herself holding this African mask. Now here she's fully dressed uh, as the model in Man Ray's photograph was not, but do notice these big white cuffs she's got and the gloves, how that sets off and accentuates the mask she's holding. So we're in 1935, we're before the Second World War and during difficult times. This is also Man Ray, and this is a model posing with a sculpture. You're only seeing part of the sculpture. You're seeing its legs, knees bent uh, to its posterior. And I'm not showing the whole slide because it's quite a graphic nude. And it's a nude white woman with a very voluptuous African sculpture. It's uh, 1934 and it's uh, 28 by about 29 cm small, but this is only a detail. Please keep that form in mind of the African sculpture because here it is and it's stunning. So in a brief talk such as this, it's impossible to go through every piece in these visionary collectors' lives and collections. So I've identified key pieces that we might take as icons of the collecting process. Now, this is called a queen, the Bangwa queen. She wasn't actually an imperial queen, 
but a queen of the spirit. Um, it's very strong spiritual significance. Let's consider collecting, why we collect, who collects, what happens. So my point of view about collecting is just a reminder that these are material objects. An owner is only ever a custodian. In ideal circumstances, the object lives well beyond the lifetime of the collector, which is why we want to consider the legacy of collecting. Just a quick look at the provenance of this piece, which is now in a Paris museum, is it went through many hands. Helena Rubinstein owned it in the 30s. And during those monumental sales in New York, it was part of the sale in 1966. It was bought by a dealer who really uh, promoted African art uh, globally. So this is now uh, in a museum and the photograph is taken from a book called Heroic Africans, Legendary Leaders and Iconic Sculptures. This is an icon, this beautiful sculpture. Helena Rubinstein was very savvy so if we look to this slide, which is an installation from the Brooklyn Museum from 1954 to 1955, on the far left, we see the beautiful Bangwa Queen. And she, we're looking at her sideways, so you can see her image uh, with that beautiful um, undulating shaped body. What about Helena Rubinstein at home? This is her uh, magnificent home in Paris. And over the years, I've, I'm so fascinated by these women collectors that I've looked at many, many photographs of their homes wherever I can find them. Um, and we, what I noticed is that she really lived with these pieces. Yes, they were available for major museum exhibitions, but she lived with them. Consequently, she moved them around. So as and when, if we ever say, oh, she put this thing way at the top or she put this at the bottom, we can't be too certain of that because she, she lived at them and moved them from time to time. Um, if you look on the upper left of the black and white image, some of those pieces have recently been on the market again um, in Paris at auction. Obviously, Helena Rubinstein loved shape and form, and so this is also in her collection. It's a Brancusi called the White Negress. And again, in today's world, we may, may or may not want to use that terminology. 1928, uh, beautiful white marble. So this gives you a little bit of a feeling for Helena Rubinstein, why she bought art, how she bought art, what she did with her art. It's part and parcel of commerce and culture for her. I'd also like to mention that she did meet with artists, living artists at the time, although she was not, like Peggy Guggenheim, a patron of artists uh, as, a, as a notable feature of her life. However, this one really caught my eye from 1940 because we don't know the photographer, but it's of one of another female heroine uh, of many of us, Frida Kahlo. And after visiting Frida in Mexico City uh, in 1940, she Helena Rubinstein wrote to Frida Kahlo and said, I really feel in such sympathy with you. She said, very simpatico, because they were both women who stood up for themselves and forged a life, whether as an entrepreneur and art collector or as an artist, each with a unique vision. Now, we see Helena Rubinstein here as a more aged woman, and this is in her New York home, and behind her is the Salvador Dali painting. So very much her art was part of a, not a, when I say staging, I don't mean that in any kind of artificial way, but she composed her life and presented her life in very, uh, very uncertain terms. She was in charge of who she was and how she presented herself. So let's move on to Peggy Guggenheim, who, uh, like Helena Rubinstein, collected African art, collected Brancusi sculpture, but Peggy Guggenheim was a tremendous supporter, uh, champion of living artists. 
This is her as an ingenue. She too came from a very privileged background um, and was used to the good things in life. Unlike Helena Rubinstein, who absolutely just, just created her life from herself out of her own um, tremendous genius and, and ambition. So this is really the tremendous legacy that we have of this beautiful uh, palazzo uh, in Venice, which is a must see for anyone wanting to see the Guggenheim collection and see museums uh, in Venice. You see the name is so subtle, so, um, so unobtrusive. On the far left bottom of the slide, you see it just says very simply, very dignified Peggy Guggenheim. Um, in 1969, the Solomon Guggenheim Museum in New York invited Peggy Guggenheim to show her collection there. And then it was subsequently that Peggy Guggenheim uh, donated her collection and the Palazzo. So when you enter uh, behind the, go through the, these magnificent doors, if we look at the lintel, it says Peggy Guggenheim Collection, the Solomon Guggenheim Foundation. Always helpful to know what a collector thinks he or she is doing. And for me, a great definition of success is defining what success is for oneself and then making that happen, whatever that is. Um, of course, obviously, to in we uh, personally, I would like it to be ethical and noble. Now, what about Peggy Guggenheim? This is um, a published quote from her. She says, I dedicated myself to my collection. A collection means hard work. It was what I wanted to do and I made it my life's work. I am not an art collector. I am a museum. That's, that's well, good, good for Peggy because uh, yes, indeed, she is a museum and the Peggy Guggenheim Museum is fabulous. Collecting is hard work and it is, it can come all embracing life's work. Here we see an older Peggy Guggenheim. Um, when I mentioned the First World War in our timeline slide, it, it's quite evident that she did move around uh, a little bit. Um, she was forced to move in her support for a lot of artists in Europe, particularly with the Nazi occupation. So she assembled the core of her collection in London, Paris and New York between 1938 and 1947. Today we say, yes, of course, of Picasso. But remember, at that time, he was a contemporary artist and many collectors who did not grasp his significance would have preferred Impressionist or Old Masters. Not Peggy Guggenheim, she saw the brilliance in her contemporaries. So here we have Picasso's On the Beach from painted in 1937. And on the right is a little bit of uh, a favorite image of Peggy Guggenheim's in front of her palazzo and wearing these just absolutely outrageous uh, uh, eyeglasses, sun, sun shades. I, I remember my first impression of visiting the Peggy Guggenheim Museum and I absolutely loved in her bedroom was this display of uh, pieces from Calder from the great sculptor Calder, and it was pieces like jewelry and so on that Calder had made. Very personal, very, uh, very intimate. By the way, Helena Rubinstein, sometimes you see her wearing earrings that were designed Picasso and, and uh, other artists. Um, here's a 1941, 1940s picture of Peggy Guggenheim, hands-on, by the way, not in an art installer, Please have a look at her. She's in the far left of this black and white slide and she's adjusting the um, straightening up a, a painting. Um, do also note the African and Oceanic sculptures that were already seen uh, is as one of a great interest of Helena Rubinstein. So she collected really, Peggy Guggenheim collected really, really meaningful paintings full of messages 1941, 42, Max Ernst, anti-Pope, and Max Ernst went on to become one of Peggy Guggenheim's uh, spouses. Brancusi, just showing this here because this is one of Brancusi's most famous in polished brass, whereas Helena Rubinstein, we looked at the beautiful white marble piece. 
Barbara Hutton, 1912 to 1979. She was known as either the world's uh, richest little girl or along those lines. She was famous from the moment she was born. She inherited her wealth at age seven. Um, causes and conditions, what are some of those? As we will go on to see about Barbara Hutton as a collector, she understood provenance and she understood the best and excellence. She had funds to do so. That was her outer life. Her inner life, she unfortunately was the one to discover or come upon her mother after her mother had committed suicide. And undoubtedly this created for her a very troubled life. She married many, many times and happiness seemed to elude her. Excellence, superb. Here's a necklace that has been shown a number of times in Hong Kong at auction when it's changed hands. It was actually a gift from her father. These are beautifully translucent jade beads that are, they measure between about mm, 15 to 19 millimeters. Uh, you can see they're slightly graduated towards the front center. And we have Barbara Hutton on the left wearing that. Um, she had the clasp changed and it's a Cartier clasp. It's unsigned, but it is a Cartier. So many of us have seen this in Hong Kong a couple of times. It's changed hands and it's just magnificent. 27 very large jade beads, brilliant green color and excellent translucency. Basically, you can't get better than that. Another area of interest to Barbara Hutton, aside from jewelry, was Chinese porcelain. Uh, unlike Helena Rubinstein, who was a self-made woman who really used the image of art as a way to present herself to the world, Barbara Hutton had very little reason to use her art collection that way because from childhood she was known as one of the world's wealthiest women. It's a little bit hard to trace this. I don't have a, a, a personal copy of this catalog, but it comes from one of the few times that we see a grouping of Barbara Hutton's collection of Chinese porcelain. It was presented at the Honolulu Academy of Arts from 1956 November to January 1957, a short run. It didn't present all of her pieces, uh, but it presented something from a particular point of view. So in that catalog from the 50s, here's what the director wrote. It has been our intention in selecting 50 examples for illustration within these pages to call attention to the range of the collection and to emphasize the discriminating taste of its owner who chose the pieces from the point of view of personal enjoyment without any attempt to gather together a comprehensive survey of Qing porcelain types. How might this inform the way we collect or when we assess collections? Barbara Hutton collected undoubtedly the best of the best, but she did not attempt to make a comprehensive survey. And I think that's very important with collecting to at the outset determine Initially, what is the projected scope of the collection? That allows a kind of discipline, uh, although it obviously can, it should come with uh, personal enjoyment and personal taste. When one collects, sometimes you get taken down different avenues and the collection grows and changes and so on. Um, but in any case, it is terribly important to establish a point of view, not buying what other people think you should have or what they is, think is important. It's what an individual thinks is important. Researches, checks out provenance and so on, and subsequently collects. We're going to come back, by the way, to um, uh, Barbara Hutton and her ceramics. But for anyone who's watching who loves jewelry, let me emphasize again provenance. So just very quickly, Queen Emily of Portugal's ruby necklace is on Barbara Hutton wearing on the far left as a necklace. In the middle slide, she's had it changed to a tiara and she's paired it with a double stranded golden yellow Japanese pearl necklace she purchased in Japan 1959. 
And then something that relates very precisely to our timeline view at the beginning of this evening's talk is the Romanov tiara and her Pasha diamond ring, a 55 karat white brilliant cut diamond. This talk is not about jewelry per se, but it is about collecting. So when we looked at 1911, the dissolution of the Qing Empire, 1935, the exhibition in London of great Chinese treasures, think also of the, the Russian Empire, the Romanovs. So with the dissolution of that empire, the imperial background, it meant that many, many pieces of supreme excellence and just outstanding quality became available on the market. Moving on to Doris Duke, this is a little bit of a, a collage image. She had uh, truly very global tastes, as we'll explore. Like Barbara Hutton, she was born in 1912. Um, I alluded to Barbara Hutton's rather unhappy, tragic life. Doris Duke lived many, many more years than her friend and peer, uh, Barbara Hutton. This is stunning. This is Shangri-La. Shangri-La, which is the center for Islamic art and design at Diamond Head in Hawaii. And this was Doris Duke's home. It is now an outstanding museum that has collaboration with the Honolulu Academy of Arts. Please take a look at the, not so much the swimming pool that you can see in the far distance with the diving board, but please look at the stepped water fall as it goes down. How fabulous that is with its angularity and linearity in contrast with nature and the, the waves and the natural forming ebb and flow of the ocean. There's a pavilion at the bottom of this garden, changing pavilion for swimming, which is modeled after something, a building that Barbara, um, excuse me, Doris Duke saw in um, Tehran, in Iran. So we're now looking at another water feature at Doris Duke's Shangri-La. So we talked about Pan Am and transglobal um, travel, global globalization. Doris Duke had the most really amazing mind. She was fascinated by many, many things. And one of her great loves was Islamic art, particularly art and design. So naturally architecture plays a part of that. It's a very beautiful um, vista that you see here. And it's probably modeled after Shalimar, which is a world UNESCO site in Lahore, Pakistan. These uh, water features are very uh, typical as well in Mughal architecture. Here's a, a sort of collage again of how did Doris Duke live? So in 1935, she visited the Taj Mahal and she subsequently commissioned a marble bedroom suite with door frames, lattice screens, inlaid panels. Uh, it, just tremendous to have that vision and of course the funds through which to realize this vision. Um, she wasn't enslaved by it. She liked Mughal architecture, but she was also interested in many, many other types of Islamic art and design. She turned um, the dining room to almost like a tent and she used Egyptian and Indian textiles, very much evocative of a nomadic life and very different from the water features that we saw uh, in Lahore and also in her Shangri-La. Please keep in mind some of the textiles you see in the upper right the, the, um, in her dining room. We'll come to those again. Sorry, I can't get really can't get enough of Shangri-La. She she was quite free in her juxtaposing of elements. In other words, it was her vision of how she would blend art and design from many Islamic countries, many Islamic expressions of art. And I, I really love the way that she basically said, yes, this is my interpretation, but with authentic pieces and with authentic craftsmanship. 
This is a failed project of Doris Dukes, but it extends us into a different realm. Um, sh she was deeply, deeply interested in Southeast Asian art. Now on the right is what she had hoped would be a village, a Thai village. She had actually started this in Hawaii uh, in the grounds of the very large Shangri-La, but it burned to the ground. Then uh, in Duke Farms in New Jersey, where she had another home, were the architectural components. She, again, art, design, architecture was her thing. She met with Jim Thompson in Bangkok. Um, those of you who know his house know that he also reconstructed traditional Thai dwellings, with absolutely magnificent teak interiors. And Doris Duke had, had much the same vision. Legacies. Let's now move into our century, the 21st century. Helena Rubinstein, Peggy Guggenheim, Barbara Hutton, and Doris Duke. These are only snippets of events, exhibitions that have occurred in since the year 2000. So in 2002, looking on the far left, the Shangri-La Museum for Islamic Art and Design and Culture was instituted in Honolulu. Doris Duke had owned the house since the 30s, but it became uh, that. In uh, 2205 to 2008, Enduring Threads, her Central Asian um, art, uh, embroidered textiles were show. In 2006 in Hong Kong, we saw a magnificent Barbara Hutton porcelain, jade shears and shimmering feathers It was presented as. And we'll, we'll go through some of these. So suffice it to say that in the 20th, 21st century, there has been a formidable legacy left by these collectors. We saw this earlier. This is from the exhibition in New York in the Jewish Museum of many of the portraits that uh, that were commissioned by Helena Rubinstein, always fascinated by her own face, but sought many different uh, artists to interpret it. A recent exhibition at the Museum of Jewish Art and History in Paris, Helena Rubinstein, and now one that's just closed in Paris, Helena Rubinstein, Madame's Collection, which focuses on her African and Oceanic art. It has a beautiful publication, currently available in French, and the English version will be available soon. This is an uh, installation of that iconic sculpture that we've seen uh, juxtaposed against a photo of Helena Rubinstein. Peggy Guggenheim. Many of us have been to the collection and enjoy it. Here it is, Peggy Guggenheim collection, very dignified, straightforward. What is not so well known is her, what was called um, an ethnic art collection, Ethno Passion. In Lugano, there was a special exhibition of her work, of her collection in 2008. Another installation view, like Helena Rubinstein, she lived with the art. It wasn't for collecting and storing. Please have a look at the bottom of the slide and we see some of the African and Oceanic art. The Swallow's Bowl from Barbara Hutton's collection. I'm smiling here because many of us, some of us had the chance to hold it from the Robert Chang collection, broke all records at the time and uh, from Barbara Hutton's collection. Here it is in the 1950s, displayed in Honolulu in the catalog in black and white and to the right in color. Barbara Hutton left her house, Winfield House, to the United States government. It's now the home of the US ambassador. This is the one very solid legacy. How about her necklace? Where is that? Where could it have gone? It was recently acquired, fairly recently, by the Cartier Foundation. So recently it's been in China. It was in the Forbidden City last year, 2019, and it was in Sichuan in Chengdu in 2005, 2000, um, excuse me, 2015. Beautiful translucency. Doris Duke, Emerald Cities, Arts of Siam and Burma, 2009 to 10, Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, an installation view. And the key piece that is the front cover of the catalog. We'll quickly go through just a range of these, these items, decorative pieces and religious pieces. 
Um, this was a very easy slide to illustrate because it's from Instagram and or Facebook. Shangri-La Museum of Islamic Art, Culture and Design. Shangri-La is a museum for learning about the global cultures of Islamic art and design. What is Muslim culture? One of the programming uh, that's available there. Collection, digitized. On the far right, you see how easy it is to access the collection online in categories. So with that, I want to thank you, everyone who's watching, and mostly I want to thank the OCS again for the invitation to speak. And I want to thank the songs of the sirens. The sirens are the art pieces that continue to live in many varied situations and call to us as people who love art, design, culture. And they were the songs that the four visionary women collectors responded to. As we've seen through the legacy, they also have left songs behind them. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you, Catherine, for a fantastic lecture. Um, I just love um, seeing how these women express themselves through their collections. Um, and I've been really personally also inspired by Shangri-La. I was really fascinated not just by the story and, and Doris Duke's passion for uh, Islamic art and architecture and, and everything Mughal, um, also fascinated a little bit with her private life. Mm. Um, I, I, did, <laughs> I think the gossip is that she she also single-handedly revived uh, through her lover, you know, the the sport of surfing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she did. She did. Yeah. And, and, it, and in, in fact, Tina, there are several um, uh, films now. Uh, there are two versions of films about her life. So, but I want, if I may, just mention something. Uh, in fact. The Doris Duke Foundation has actually asked this question themselves. Beyond being a socialite, beyond being an immensely wealthy woman, who was Doris Duke? Mm. And so thank you for mentioning that she reintroduced the art of surfing because no, well, no, I think she had she she had intended, I think she was um, a double heiress, wasn't she? She had, uh, her money came from from two sources, I think oil and something else. And, um, and it seemed as if her life was mapped out for her until she got to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Everything got derailed and she established this amazing home that she ended up spending most of her life in. Yes. Um, yes. And, uh, you know, thanks to the love of a good man, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Also, but don't forget about her home in Rhode Island. Oh, I know nothing about. Oh, yeah. oh yes, Duke Farms and Rhode Island, Newport. Oh yes, there's <laughs> lots more to learn and cover. <laughs> um, she, of course, also uh, a good friend of ours, Yiwan Kuhn. She studied at the Institute of Fine Arts in New York, and that's of course called Doris Duke um, yes. House. Um, yes. And I. I remember when I visited Shangri-La that uh, the person that was taking us around said that she, in fact, ended up um, competing with institutions for purchasing significant pieces of mm. Islamic art and architecture. Okay, that's very good to know because I more or less downplayed that. So thank you for mentioning. Yeah, it's. Uh, um, I, I think what you know st stands out to me is that despite her vast wealth, mm. she very clearly identified that it was art and design. And she was very content with finding rare examples of pieces that may not have been necessarily very costly, but were absolutely essential to preserve. Which I think is a fantastic show of confidence of someone to do that. Um, and undoubtedly, she would have been hounded by dealers wanting to sell her the oh, most expensive. Exactly. <laughs> I can imagine. I mean, actually, all all four women must have been incredibly um, smart uh, and uh, canny in in deciding how to build their collections. Oh, because definitely. I'm I'm, pr yes. I'm pretty sure yes. 
it's yeah. exactly as you say that they would have been approached and would have been right. um you know people would have recognized their tremendous wealth yes. and um uh, their means um i have a question here which um is is very pertinent given that we have focused on four women from ivy chan who asks yeah. oh. um, she comments, thank you for this enlightening talk. Apart from these four individuals, which other influential 20th century female collectors or even dealers do you think deserve more attention? Why do you think, uh, what do you think are the key reasons why female collectors have been so under-researched? Mm -hmm. Well, if I may, and hello, Ivy, <laughs> nice to get your question, thank you. Um, you know, it's very interesting that I, tend to make quite a strong distinction between collectors who are solely collectors and others who are dealer slash collectors. Um, so I'm, I'm, the question also asks who else is outstanding, mm -hmm. but the, the question I'd like to address more is about why are they, they overlooked and so on. And, um, I believe that collecting takes quite a bit of aggression because your hunt. So to me, if we take the model of hunting and gathering, just very simplistic, I know. But collecting takes hunting, looking, checking, mm. fighting for the best if, if necessary. And I feel that um, women are not necessarily socialized to express that easily. I think women that have great wealth are, as you were saying, they're approached easily and, and you know, they have the means. But I, I feel that um, women, women are socialized in ways that are so different from men. And in fact, I just read an article on Artnet that was looking at 21st today's art collectors and they're saying women are still underrepresented because of a very interesting reason that let's say they set aside a certain amount of of disposable income of private wealth of wealth for collecting this survey said that women would prefer to endow chairs to endow curatorships would prefer to use that same money for uh, acquisitions so rather than collecting for oneself it would be in the interest would be in a much more nurturing manner in other words to encourage others by endowing chairs of research study and leadership so I think you know the question about the dealers I I actually don't look at them as models because I I I feel that they that it's very mixed if they especially if they're dealing and collecting in the same sphere mm. so they they honestly don't interest me very much <laughs> <laughs> except when they have something nice that i might want to you know that someone might want to buy but they, they just don't interest me intellectually it's not i'm really really interested in women who collect for the sake of art mm. for their love and joy of art and mm. i'm very interested in ones like that that have this vision of what are they going to leave behind mm. and how will they do that? Mm. So anyway, I hope that answered somewhat. Well, I'm really thrilled that you showed those last few slides about how you know many of these uh, collectors are now being recognized and their collections are being recognized. Yes by museums and I do think that there's a tremendous public fascination for collections that are built um, by by individuals where the individuals are um, where the individuals are sort of identified and we know more about their interests, their personal yes. interests. I can see Renee just in the corner there. <laughs> 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 I, I thank everyone for their patience with, with this. We've oh, had a few goodness. technical hitches yeah. this evening, but Catherine has been so so graceful and uh, <laughs> um, uh, for <laughs> bearing with this. So we have a question from our new uh, EXCO member, David Kwan. Yes. Can you tell us a bit about the hard work or hardship that these women collectors went through in building their collections? Oh, definitely. Um, the 
Well, the, let, let me address Barbara Hutton, who is a cautionary tale, undoubtedly, because her collection basically was dispersed. And trying to research it is really, really hard work. You have to comb through so many auction catalogs to find out where pieces went. So, um, you know, her hardship was very interesting in a very unsustainable, unexpected way is not only did everyone want to sell things to her, everyone wanted things from her. And so, for example, it's well known that if someone, if she was wearing a magnificent piece of jewelry, if someone said, oh, I like that, she would just give it to them. Um, so, you know, she had a hardship of being a high profile person. Uh, of the 20th century collectors that we, we looked at with historical events, it was, I, I would say, Peggy Guggenheim with knowing what to do in World War II. You know, yeah. how do you keep pieces safe? Yeah. Where do you keep them? And in fact, um, let's go back to Barbara Hutton's Winfield House, that magnificent estate in Regent's Park, London. She had to evacuate that home during the war. And it is thought that a number of pieces, both in her jade collection and her Chinese porcelain collection were lost or destroyed. So those are the kind of hardships um, of external events. And speaking of, of other hardships or hard work, collecting with a standard of excellence is very hard work. It doesn't just happen. So researching provenance, getting good advisors, um, is 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 really hard work. So we go back to Peggy Guggenheim's statement about, you know, I am not a collector. Uh, I am a museum. So taking that standard of excellence and, and I would say also having the discipline of always saying this is not good enough. I'm going to wait for a better piece. I'd say that's a hardship because it takes tremendous, tremendous <laughs> self-control. <laughs> <laughs> Tremendous discipline and self-control. Yeah. Mm. Um, the, you mentioned Barbara Hutton, and I, I should say that in my previous life, I worked at the Hong Kong U um, Museum and Art Gallery, and there they do have a, a small collection of export porcelains that come from oh. the Barbara Hutton collection. Oh. So should anyone in Hong Kong want to see some um, pieces from uh, her collection, you can um, go along to Hong Kong U and see these uh, amazing, uh, quite quite ostentatious export porcelain right. pieces. Right. Okay. Um, and those were donated to the museum. They were not uh, acquired by the museum. Uh, they yes. were they were acquired for the museum uh, from Barbara Hutton's collection. Um, may, I, may I dare mention another museum in Hong of Kong? Course, of Chinese course. Chinese University of Hong Kong has several Barbara Hutton porcelain pieces that were acquired at auction and were donated by significant members of the other the governing board or the trustees to the museum. And I'm just sorry to say that I only learned about this uh, a few days ago in discussion with a, with a, a museum curator friend, and I didn't have time to research and present them, but they're there. So maybe you might like to ask Josh Yu if he would like to give a talk. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> I'm, I'm Barbara I'm speaking to Josh about other talks. <laughs> yeah. OK. Um, I, I wanted to go just make a comment about uh, Peggy Guggenheim. Of course, you know, many of us have had the privilege of being able to visit her home in Venice and yes. and to have that vision of. Um, I, I think this is it's a it's a really uh, useful thing to bear in mind for any collector is um, what will be the ultimate um, destination for these works. I do think of um, works of art as having a, a lifespan much longer than ours. They will survive. They will will outlive us. And um, you know, it, we do have a, um, a responsibility to take care of things and, and to ensure that they have a lifespan beyond uh, that that lives in yes. our hands. Um, and she clearly had that vision. Um, and um, but but the, the flip side of that was planning for the future, planning for beyond her life life yes. uh, span. Yes. But because she was collecting the work of living artists, yes. she had um, 
in a way, a kind of a double privilege, not just of ensuring the legacy of things that she was collecting, but also uh, of patronage. Yes, um, and in a way, Doris Duke, even though she was collecting um, Islamic art and architecture, she was also nurturing a living craft because yes, she was commissioning uh, works. Um, Absolutely. So we have another question here, um, one from Chen Hua, uh, our committee member. Thank you for the great talk. Can you tell us how the legacy of these female collectors inform your own curatorial approach? Thank you. Uh, what a good question. Well, I would say it really does teach me about do's and don'ts. Um, and particularly the feeling of, as Tina, you just mentioned about the responsibility, the, the, the legacy, what to do, uh, because the, you know, in, in I mean, I, I must say I, I do collect in very, very minor ways. Um, and recently I'm very interested in textiles, for example. And so I'll just give a very personal example. I was really, really thrilled because I collect batik. And I just found a good example from 1970s of batik that was done in Mexico and very hard to find. And I actually purchased it with the idea of eventually donating it to the textile museum in Canada. So I would collect and so I let, let's because I'm not a collector of note by, by any means, but curating my own interests, for example, as a curator, that particular piece of Mexican batik mm -hmm. is crucial to what I want to be able to curate of a certain development of batik that, of course, would start with Javanese examples mm -hmm. and, and it must be hand done and, and so on and so forth. So I think the all of the the uh, women have have provided excellent examples and uh, I just I just think Barbara Hutton, though, is so tragic. It's she's really um cautionary tale of these are responsibilities and the legacy and that's why i was saying i'm so happy that that beautiful jade necklace was a, reacquired by cartier for their permanent collection no that that also really made me happy because yes. it seems as if they have a mission to um share share it as an object of great design mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for sure mm. I, I wanted to share just a little um, uh, anecdote from my, my own journeys. Um, just oddly, um, a few years ago, I was in London and I went to this small museum uh, in, I think it's Granary Square, just near St Pancras, mm -hmm. called the House of Illustration, oh. very randomly. And there was a small exhibition there of um, a, a book that had been um, illustrated by somebody called Jacqueline Iyer. Mm -hmm. And she was a young go-getting thing in New York who ran around with the Warhol crowd. She was a model briefly. And then she married and um, ended up in Thailand. And you mentioned Jim Thompson and oh, you yes. mentioned uh, uh, textiles just now. So I yeah. just wanted to share this. She became a textile designer oh. and um, uh, as an illustrator and, um, you know, uh, with some creative skill and, and being in Thailand, she ended up making these really beautiful textiles. I guess. <laughs> Eight o'clock, it must be. <laughs> I hope we don't turn into pumpkins. No, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's midnight. <laughs> Um, and it's it's really one of those, you know, amazing um, collisions of worlds uh, mm -hmm. from downtown New York to downtown Bangkok yes. and creating textiles that were made um, into uh, f fashion items. Mm -hmm. 
So we're, we're kind of at time, and I would like to thank everyone for joining this lecture this evening. Thank you, Catherine, for a really fascinating lecture. I know that we had some um, viewers from OCS London that were very appreciative, um, and uh, many of our um, viewers this evening have said what a fantastic lecture this was. I do hope that you'll be able to um, speak to us again in the future. We have very much enjoyed this, and I think um, um, you've really opened our eyes to both uh, the psychology of collecting and uh, the um, tremendous amount that we have to learn about uh, these four uh, visionary collectors. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you all for joining us. You can see that we, we've um, put up a message here that um, uh, to thank you for your support this year. Um, we will um, be bringing you some new uh, lectures uh, next year and um, hope that we can uh, enjoy your support uh, in the future. Um, if you've enjoyed this lecture and uh, the series in particular by Professor Lam, please do uh, consider supporting us um, uh, via one-off donation or by joining. Thank you all for joining again uh, this lecture this evening, and I wish you all uh, a wonderful holiday season. Stay, uh, stay well, uh, good health, um, good spirits, um, Merry Christmas, um, and good evening. <laughs>